Soul Questions. Have you ever wondered why we get goosebumps in the first place? You can call them goosebumps, goose pimples, or goose flesh. They're all the same thing. Little bumps that form on your skin when you're cold or when you experience strong emotions like excitement or fear. They're a reflex, which means that you can't make yourself get them. They just happen automatically. That reflex has a fancy scientific name. It's called the pillow motor reflex, and it's not just humans who have it. Porcupines and sea otters, for instance, have the same reflex, raising their quills or hairs when they're scared or sense danger. Okay, so we know what causes us to get goosebumps, but why? Why do we have a goosebump reflex, and why does it cause little bumps on our skin? Well, the reason why isn't all that different from our porcupine and sea otter friends. You see, when you're cold or afraid, your brain sends signals to all the muscles in your body, basically saying, alert, alert. That signal causes all your muscles to react by tensing up, and the little teeny tiny muscles in your skin attached to the base of your hairs also tense up, causing them to stand on end. And a little bit of skin around the hair bulges like a flexing muscle. And just like that, your arms are covered in goosebumps. Oh, and you might be wondering, why do we call them goosebumps, pimples, or flesh? Because, well, they look like the skin of a bird whose feathers have been plucked like a goose. Makes sense, right? What causes our skin to wrinkle when it gets wet? It might not seem like it, but your skin is actually completely covered in a thin layer of oils. They are produced by your skin, help protect it, and most importantly, make it waterproof. If you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Our skin doesn't actually absorb water when it gets wet. Water either drips off, evaporates, or dries up. The wrinkly problem comes when you spend a little too much time in the water. You see, water slowly washes the special oils off of your skin, leaving your skin not so waterproof. Now that the oil is gone, the water can start absorbing into your skin, causing that wicked wrinkle. Okay, so that's why your skin wrinkles if you're in water long enough, but it still leaves one question. Why is it only our fingers and toes that wrinkle while the rest of our skin stays smooth? Well, that's because the skin on your fingers and toes is a lot thicker than the skin on the rest of your body. Since those layers of skin are much thicker, they have a lot more dead skin cells in them too. When water washes off the oils from your skin, those dead cells soak up a ton of water like a million tiny sponges. All that extra water needs space which causes the outer layers of skin to swell and pull on layers below. But those layers underneath don't have dead skin cells, so they don't swell. The combination of the swelling outer skin and the pulling of deeper layers is what causes the ripple effect we call wrinkles or pruny fingers. So no need to freak out next time you pencil dive into a pool or spend an afternoon in the surf and your fingertips shrivel up like prunes. What causes your hair to go white as we age? Every human hair has two parts, a shaft and a root. The shaft is mostly what we see when we think of hair, the long, colorful part that grows out of our head. The root is the part that keeps the hair attached. The root of every single hair stays stuck to your scalp by squeezing it into a little sac called a follicle. These follicles produce a special kind of chemical called melanin, which is what determines the color of our hair, eyes, and skin. The more melanin you have, the darker the hair, eyes, or skin. As we get older, the special cells in our hair follicles begin to die. Since those are the cells that give your hair its color, the follicle starts pumping out hairs without any color one by one. Okay, so that's why your hair goes white, but is there anything you can do when you're young to prevent it? Nope. Some people start getting gray hairs young, and others take some time, but eventually everyone will get some gray hair. The best way to gauge how your hair will fare when you're older is to look at your parents and other older family members. How your hair ages is determined by genetics, meaning your parents pass it down to you, so chances are your hair will look like one of your parents by the time you grow up. Why do our bellies growl when we're hungry? Well, it turns out that there's a scientific term for the sound your stomach makes, borborygmi, which is a Greek word that's an onomatopoeia, meaning the word is supposed to sound like the noise it's describing. 
all that rumbling and growling you hear in your belly is coming from either your stomach or intestines, and it happens to everyone. Usually we associate a rumbling belly with an empty stomach, but sometimes it can rumble even if you aren't hungry. You see, whenever you eat food, the muscles in your digestive tract push the food through your intestinal tubes, breaking it down and absorbing the food's nutrients. Your intestines are one long hollow tube that runs from your mouth all the way to your butt. The walls are made of smooth muscle that squeeze and expand to mush up the digesting food. As the food is broken down, gas and bubbles of air get mixed in, and little pockets of air and gas cause that squeezing to make a rumbling sound. The noises are usually more muffled when your stomach is full because the food absorbs most of the sound. But when your belly is empty, those rumblings are much louder and easier to hear. An hour or two after a meal, your stomach will send signals to your brain, letting it know that you're full and it's time to fire up the digestive system. The sounds start again a few hours later, when your belly is looking to digest more food. So it fires up the old stomach contractions just to check and see if anything got left behind from before. Okay, so that's how stomach growls work, but we all know when we're hungry. So why does our body also make sounds to let us know? Well, the feeling of your stomach contracting and trying to digest food that isn't there is awfully uncomfortable. That growly feeling of an empty stomach is a great motivator to get up and go find some food. Why does our mouth water when we're hungry? We all recognize the telltale signs of hunger. Pangs in your stomach, maybe a growl or two, endless cravings for the food you love, and of course, salivation. In order to understand why our mouths water, we first need to know what drool actually does. Saliva actually helps us digest our food. It's the very first stage of breaking down the food we eat. Spit is made mostly of water, but there's less than 1% of it that's made up of proteins, lipids, and electrolytes. All that stuff helps to break down the food you're chewing up before it gets to your belly. So why do our mouths water when we're hungry? Because when we see a food we really want to eat, we start to imagine what it would taste like. Our body reacts to those thoughts by prepping us to eat, and a big part of that preparation is producing saliva to help us chow down. You see, every time you smell, see, or even imagine eating food when you're hungry, our brains send a signal to the medulla oblongata. That's the part of the brain that controls things you do without thinking, like breathing, pumping blood, and, yes, salivating. The medulla oblongata starts to prep for the big meal you're imagining, and almost instantly your mouth will start to water even without you noticing. So, in other words, your mouth begins to water because, well, it's time to eat. What causes allergies in the first place? If you're lucky enough to not have allergies, you probably have a friend or family member who does. The triggers range from animals, medications, and foods to dust, pollen, and microbes floating around in the air. The most common food allergies are things like milk, eggs, nuts, especially peanuts, shellfish, wheat, soy, fish, and tons of others. Lots of allergies have nothing to do with food. Pollen, dust mites, mold, animal dander, insect stings, latex, and certain medications are the most common culprits. Allergies cause all types of terrible reactions. Watery, itchy, red eyes, coughing, sneezing, Achoo. runny or itchy nose, rashes, hives, stomach cramps, and even <clears throat> vomiting. Ugh. Okay, so those are the most common allergies, but what actually causes an allergic reaction? Well, whenever you have an allergy to something, your body is mistaking something harmless, like a pollen or a peanut, as a possible threat. Your body then kicks into overdrive producing antibodies to fight off the harmless allergen that it's mistaking for danger. 
Those well-meaning antibodies release chemicals called histamines into your blood. Histamines are great when you really need to fight something off, but when they attack by mistake, like during an allergic reaction, they cause a lot of the classic symptoms. Itchiness, redness, swelling, and all the rest. Most allergic reactions are a bother, but not super dangerous. But there are some kinds of allergic reactions that can be deadly. They can cause asthma attacks or even more severe problems breathing and swallowing until treated. According to experts, whether or not you have allergies tends to be hereditary, which means your mom and dad can pass them down to you. Usually kids don't inherit specific allergies from their parents, but they are more likely to develop their own if their parents have them. Oh, and if you're one of the lucky ones out there without any allergies, don't let your guard down yet because people can develop brand new allergies all the way into adulthood. What is a scab exactly and how do they help you heal? A scab is just the protective layer that forms over our cuts or open wounds. They start to form just about the moment your skin first gets damaged by a scrape. The moment your brain realizes you have a cut, it will start forming a blood clot where the injury is to stop the bleeding. Once the clot forms and the bleeding stops, it's time for your body to start healing the wound. As the blood clot dries out, it hardens and forms a protective layer over the cut. That's the scab. It protects the cut mainly by keeping germs, bacteria, or other icky stuff out, giving the damaged skin underneath time to heal. Scabs kinda just look like ugly lumps of gross, crusty stuff, but underneath, there's all kinds of things happening to help heal the scrape. Damaged blood vessels are being repaired, dead skin cells are being removed and replaced with brand new ones, and white blood cells roll around looking to root out and eliminate any germs that might have gotten in. After a week or two, once the body is done fixing the injured skin, the scab will fall off on its own, revealing a brand new layer of healthy skin. Sometimes it's hard not to pick and prod at a scab. After all, they're itchy, uncomfortable, and sometimes even hurt a little. But the best thing you can do is just leave the scab alone and let it do its thing. Beyond just leaving the scab alone, there are a few simple ways you can help it heal even faster. For starters, wash it with soap and water. Not only will that help clean the scab, but it'll keep it from getting too dry, which is what makes it so itchy. Bandages are also a great way to keep a scab clean, covered, and away from curious fingers. So, next time you've got a new scab you're just aching to itch, just try your best to leave it alone, if you can.